I want us to, to press pause. I'm going to tell you a little bit about this series that we're beginning today. I'm really excited about this. It's called Rebels and Reformers. And we're going to look at um, different Bible characters, a different Bible character each week over the next several Sundays. Um, and these Bible characters, one of the things that they all have in common is that they were young when God called them out and used them to rebel against um, a broken culture and to bring reformation, to, to bring people back into right living and a right relationship with God. And today we are going to look at the young prophet by the name of Jeremiah. And Jeremiah had the reputation of being the weeping prophet, this young teenage boy uh, known as the weeping prophet. Now, I don't know if when, when I first kind of heard that that was his, his nickname, so to speak, um, I, I kind of thought of, you know, was he, did he just cower in fear? What was this weeping like? Was he always discouraged and depressed? But actually, um, we read throughout his self-titled book that he was one that had tremendous hope even in spite of the discouragement all around him, the things that broke his heart and caused him to weep, he had great hope that God was going to be faithful in continuing to show, to show love to his people. When we talk about a rebel, the first thing you, that comes to mind might be somebody that um, is angry and lashing out against something. But Jeremiah and many of these other characters that we're going to look at are, are a reminder to us that the root of rebellion starts with hope. There is a really deep hope that God can make things, bring things back to where they should be. There's a line in Rogue One of the Star Wars series. Um, I don't know where it is in, in line of all those, but the, the young Jen Urso is kind of, the, she's the female hero, the protagonist, and she is out to stop the rebuilding of the Death Star. And despite all the overwhelming odds and everything that is against, uh, against her and her mission, she says this, we have hope. Rebellions are built on hope. And we are going to, as we pause right now, we are going to celebrate the greatest rebel and reformer that walked this earth, Jesus Christ. And it is because of him that we have hope. Now, Jeremiah, in chapter 31, um, said this. The Lord put this on his heart to share with the people. Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Israel of Judah. He had hope that there would be a new covenant, that God would usher in this new era. And it's a reminder to us that as believers, we have hope. In Luke 22, um, Luke is writing about this last meal that Jesus is sharing with his closest friends. Jesus, after breaking the bread, he picks up the cup and most likely reflecting back to these words of Jeremiah, words that he was very familiar with, Jesus says, this cup that is poured out for you is the new covenant in my blood. These elements, as they are passed, I want you to remember that they are not just a representation of tear-filled sacrifice, but they are also a picture of hope, the hope that we have because of the sacrifice of Christ. So reflect on what Christ suffered and died for, for you. But maybe as you partake of the bread and the cup, you smile today because you realize that's the source of your hope that you have. Let's pray. Father, I thank you that we have hope, that you are faithful. I thank you for um, the sacrifice of Christ. And when we say we celebrate communion in a way, God, that feels kind of weird to celebrate someone's gruesome death, but really what we are celebrating is the fact that death has been defeated and that we have life in you. Thank you for that hope. It's in your name I pray. Amen. I have a 15-year-old son. His name is Jack, and uh, he's not here this morning. And the rule in our house is if you don't come to church, then you get used as a sermon illustration. So um, having said that, uh, there's something about my son, and I don't think it's unique to him. I think there would be a lot of people that might fit this category. But 
Jack cannot walk past a body of water, like a, a stream or a lake, without picking up a rock and throwing it. It is, I don't know what it is, if it's something about being a boy, something about being a teenager, I don't know, but he cannot walk past a creek, a stream, a pond, a lake. If he sees a rock, he must pick it up and he must throw it into the water. Um, if you have ever walked past a stream or a lake and there are no rocks, it's because my son has already been there. <laughs> there are no more because he, if I let him, he would just stand there all day. His arm would never get tired, rock after rock after rock. So um, we are going to look at the life of a teenager, a teenager that was right around the, the age of my 15-year-old son. We don't know exactly, but we do know that Jeremiah was pretty young. And as we look at his story, um, I want us to... I want us to see how this picture of my son throwing rocks is actually a very vivid picture of the life of Jeremiah. And we'll come to, back to that in just a moment. But I want us to, uh, to begin at the beginning of Jeremiah 1. And we're going to focus just on this, this beginning stage when God first came to Jeremiah as this young teenager and said, you are who I want to use to bring reform to the nation of Israel. So Jeremiah chapter 1, if you want to use the Pew Bible, your Bible app, um, it's going to be on the screen. Um, this is what, um, what is described to us, um, Jeremiah sharing with us the words, uh, this conversation that he had with God. Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before you were born, I set you apart. I appointed you as a prophet to the nations. Alas, sovereign Lord, I said, I do not know how to speak. I am too young. But the Lord said to me, do not say I am too young. You must go to everyone I send you to and say whatever I command you. Do not be afraid of them, for I am with you and will rescue you, declares the Lord. Then the Lord reached out his hand and touched my mouth and said to me, I have put my words in your mouth. See, today I appoint you over nations and kingdoms to uproot and tear down, to destroy and overthrow, to build and to plant. Now let me pause for just a second here. And I want you to remember that this is a teenager. And one of the things that each of us goes through in our teenage years is we are wrestling with identity. Who are we? Um, as a teenager, we want to know who are we and how do we fit in? What's our place in this world? And what I think is especially unique about this and kind of borderline crazy is God is asking a teenager to do something that is unpopular. He is asking a teenager who is probably very interested in making friends to do something that is going to alienate him, ostracize him, um, is there anything that a teenager wants more than to fit in? I don't want to just pick on teenagers. Can I say as adults, is there anything we want more than to fit in? I mean, aren't we kind of in, in our own ways wanting to be accepted, wanting to, uh, to receive the approval of others? So here we see from the very beginning that, um, that God is asking Jeremiah to, to speak a rather unpopular message. And then not just to anybody, but he is saying to this young teenage boy, I, I am asking you to go to your family and to your closest friends, and I want you to tell them something that they really don't want to hear. Pretty crazy. And so he has put all this on this young teenage boy. Let's continue reading. Today, I have made you a fortified city, an iron pillar and a bronze wall to stand against the whole land, against the kings of Judah, its officials, its priests, and the people of the land. They will fight against you, but will not overcome you, for I am with you and will rescue you, declares the Lord. So God has pointed to Jeremiah, to this young boy, and says, I want to use you to reform an entire nation. I'm going to send you with a really bold word to speak to a king, and you're going to share things with this king that he might not want to hear. This very powerful king is not going to be excited about the message of basically of doom that you are going to be sharing. 
And naturally, Jeremiah kind of backpedals a little bit. He says, I'm, I'm probably a little too young for this, God. Uh, I'm not very good at speaking, and there's someone else that could do this better. So what's the parallel between Jack throwing rocks into a lake and the life of Jeremiah? It's this. The name Jeremiah means the Lord hurls, launches, or throws. Jeremiah was one that God wanted to throw into the midst of a culture that needed to be shaken up. In biblical history, and even today, God hurls people. He throws people into specific places at a specific time to share a specific word. He uh, hurls rebels and reformers in ways that they cause an ever-widening ripple that transforms a pond of people. Rock after rock after rock, person after person after person, God's arm never tires launching rebels and reformers into a world in need of rescue and redemption. Our city needs rebels and reformers. Our city needs rebels and reformers who place their entire life in the hand of God. And what this symbolizes is kind of a yielding of their life. A rebel and reformer begins by saying, I put my life in your hands, now you direct where I land. It's up to you. I give up the control in this. Now, if your first thought is, why me? Why would God choose me, of all people, to be a rebel or a reformer? It's because God loves to throw rebels and reformers into the midst of the action. He does this all throughout Scripture. Uh, we see how he's been continuing to do this throughout history. He throws us into deep waters. He throws us in ways that disrupt placid waters of complacency. God throws rebels and reformers for the purpose of creating waves, for making a difference, for getting the attention of people, and to do so in an ever-expanding impact on the lives and the places of the people where they are thrown. In verse 7, God says to Jeremiah, you must go to everyone and say whatever I ask you to say. That's a pretty big pond <laughs> to go to everyone and to say everything. But he was obedient in this. And so the question maybe we might have at the beginning is, what pond is God desiring to throw me into, and what is it that I'm supposed to say? What kind of a splash am I supposed to make in this society, in this culture? Well, I hope that by the end of our time together this morning, you'll have um, a little bit more clarity on that. This call that he gave to Jeremiah begins with this, you must go to everyone. God was sending him, and this is a, this is a call that's very common to us. We see Jesus he raised up a group of rebels and reformers, and just before Jesus ascended, the last thing that he calls his friends to is this act of themselves being thrown out into the world. Go into all the world and make disciples. So they are thrown, and we are thrown into this world for a specific purpose. And it's almost like Jeremiah, his parents inspired, they divinely named him. They, didn't, they named their son with this name, the Lord launches, the Lord hurls, the Lord throws, because he could not stay where he was if he was to teach people who shouldn't stay where they are. If he was going to reach people who needed to change, he himself had to change where he was and where he was going. So I want us to understand a little bit more of the culture that God threw Jeremiah into. As I said, he throws us into a specific culture at a specific time. So what was that culture like for Jeremiah, especially in his teenage years? Um, if I had to give it a, a phrase that maybe we could relate to, I would say Jeremiah was raised in a post-law society. We are, we are currently living in a post-Christian society 
what Jeremiah was raised in was a post-law society. In other words, there was a time, generations before, when God gave a set of laws, a way for the people of Israel to live their lives and to experience uh, freedom and joy and blessings. And what was described and given and uh, written down by Moses was passed on to generations. And really the history of Israel goes like this, and it's based upon the times that they obeyed and disobeyed, paid attention to and ignored those laws. Well, they were in a post-law society. They were a society that didn't just ignore the laws. They were now a generation that was not aware that there were laws. They were so far removed, at least a generation, maybe two or three generations removed from the laws that God had given them in order to, to bring freedom and blessing on their life. Um, they were raised apart from the values and the world views of the godly generations that had preceded them. In other words, they were a society very similar to our society today. We live in a post-Christian society. We live in a world where Christianity is no longer the dominant civil religion of our country. We are far from that. We live in a society where the values and worldviews of our culture are not the values and worldview of the Bible, where our values are different from those of our grandparents or great-grandparents as we go back. And there is a generation right now being raised without knowledge of the Bible. They might know that it exists, but they have no knowledge of the Bible. And even more than that, there is a generation that does not realize that the life that Jesus lived on this earth is actually a model for the way that God designed us to live on this earth. We are in a post-Christian society, and we are foolish enough to think that maybe, just maybe, we can elect the right president or the right officials, and then we can begin to climb our way back. But really what we need are rebels and reformers. God will throw rebels and reformers into a post-law society, into a post-Christian society, to make a big splash, to create some waves, and to bring about some change. Now, let me tell you uh, three quick things about Jeremiah as a rebel and reformer. And like I said, over the next several weeks, we're going to look at different biblical characters. And each of them are going to have their unique ways that God called them to be a rebel and reformer. In other words, um, the, it, depending on that unique pond that God was throwing them into, their, their calling looked a little bit different. Uh, first thing about Jeremiah was... He was a reformer more than an innovator. Prophets in general, and Jeremiah in particular, did not teach new concepts or establish new laws. They called people to turn from what they were doing and sinful practices and to turn back to the teachings of the law, to those ancient pathways that had been ordained by God all along. Now, I've lived here in California for three years, and one of the things that I noticed very early on was this area, this city in particular, loves innovators. They love the person that has the next latest, greatest idea. If you have this great idea, this new product, you will have a lot of people that want to piggyback on as investors for those innovations. Um, now, don't get me wrong. I think innovation is great. God himself loves to do a new work. Um, God enjoys these things. But this is something that I think we need to be aware of. And that is, very sadly, that the American church culture craves innovation more than we do. Just being reformed and continuing with the ancient paths that brought us along as God intended. The American church has really bought into what is the latest and greatest. What's a, what's a new way that we can do church? What's a new way that we can reach the lost? Are there three simple steps that we can do that are going to really change our community and fill all the all of our pews in our church? When really what we need, I believe, is we need more Jeremiah's. Rather than trying to innovate a new way to do church, Rather than um, trying to figure out a fresh way to reach the lost, we need reformers to call us back to ancient practices, to ancient though timeless faith in God. 
reformers, reformers call us back to scripture. They call us back to prayer. They call us back to worship. They call us back to being still and knowing who God is. They call us back to reflecting on scripture, memorizing scripture. They call us back to even practices like fasting, giving ourselves involved in community. These ancient practices, a reformer calls us back to these particular things. And that is a way of reminding us that we don't need something new, we need something genuine. We need something authentic. What we are hoping for is not out there. It is already found in Christ. And like I said, as a church, in our American church culture, we can get swept up in this. Everybody around us is looking for what's new and next. But what if we became that presence, that rebelling presence against the rest of society that said, no, what we truly long for he is here among us. We don't need something new. We need him in an authentic way. Another thing that we learn about Jeremiah is uh, that he led people to both religious and social reform. Uh, he talked about social issues like the poor. How do we um, stop oppressing the poor and how do we minister to the poor? He also brought religious reform. Um, he partnered with a young king by the name of Josiah, who was another character that we'll look at in a few weeks. Um, Josiah's reign was marked by the, re the rediscovery of the law and made it available to the people. And so Jeremiah was calling them back to the God revealed in Scripture. And so it was both a religious and social change. In our city and in our day, we need to declare a clear message that, that impacts both religious and and social life. And to do this, we need rebels who lead and speak outside of the church. I believe we need fewer people speaking in the church, and we need more people being the church out in culture. We need to realize that religion was never intended to be something that we talk about in our holy huddles. It is something that we live very loudly out in the world. And the way that we love each other is the way that we preach this message. We need rebels who are not content just to do the Sunday thing, they know that God launches people out from the church to create waves in the world. And we need reformers who understand it's not like we do good things in the world or we're religious. There is no secular, sacred divide. As we see God present in all things, all things are sacred. We need rebels and reformers who wake people up to the fact that God is here and alive today in all these things, and we have a way to worship him outside of a church building, not just in a church building. The psalmist said the heavens declare the glory of God. The psalmist is out there, and he sees creation, and he sees the role that, um, that God has in all of these things, and it led him to worship. Our city needs people to worship in that way. The third thing about Jeremiah that really stands out to me is, um, as a prophet, he was more concerned about why people did something than simply what people did. He was speaking to a group of people who, even when they were obeying the letter of the law, even when they returned to the sacrificial system and this way of, of making amends for their sins that God had ordained for them in that Old Testament time, even those even though these people were obeying the letter of the law, their hearts were not being changed. They were doing good things on the outside, but they were not being transformed inwardly. They were also people that were more passionate about the temple than they were about the God of the temple, than the God who could be found in the temple. Our city needs rebels and reformers who are less passionate about our church and more passionate about the God of our church. We need more people, rebels and reformers in our cities that realize I'm called to be the church. There's this big C church. And when someone comes to us in need, we're not trying to get them to come to our church. We're trying to lead them to Jesus. Because really, there's one church here in our city. Several roofs are involved in this, but there's really one church. Are we willing to say, hey, 
if there is a place where Jesus is taught, where Jesus is exalted, you go there. I'd love to have you here. But if you find some other body of believers here in our city, so be it. Because that's, that's what you and other people will need. A rebel and reformer is far less interested in building an empire than they are in glorifying and growing God's kingdom. We need these religious reformers and rebels to help people see that this is not just a checklist of things that we do in order to gain God's favor. There is a life with a capital L that we experience. Um, We don't pick a church because it appeals to us, because we like that kind of singing, or we prefer that location, we pick a church because that's where we can throw ourselves into, where we can work alongside that church to bring change in a community. Rebels and reformers don't begin with a me-centered approach to finding a church. They realize God has thrown me into this community. Now, what church can I partner with so that I can be a part of God's work in this city. Maybe you need to go to um, find a, a city limit sign, a population sign, and go pray over that and say, God, how can you use me in this city? And then partner with ministries that will enable you to move out and to be God's hands and feet in that area. The greatest rebel and reformer that ever walked the face of this earth said this, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added unto you. Those are the words of Jesus. Be a part of a kingdom work. That's what our city needs. So what are some characteristics that for us, if we were going to be a rebel and reformer, we must what? Well, how would we fill in that blank? I believe that a rebel and reformer must choose to live fully present in the reality of the here and now. This is what I mean by that. Um, Brennan Manning, in one of his books, he talks about, um, he takes the word nowhere and he divides it into two words, now and here. And he says, if we are not living fully present now, fully awake here, then we are nowhere if we are choosing to live in the past of regret or in the future of anxiety, if we are living anywhere other than fully present to the now and here, we are nowhere. The place that God uses us is always right now, right here. Right now, right here. To be a rebel and reformer. God wants us to be aware of what's going on right now in our city. God wants us to be aware of what is happening um, in our culture. This is critical. And um, one, of the, one of the commentators I read uh, said this, uh, based upon specifically Jeremiah, what is going on right now in this world at this time in history is critical. A prophet is obsessed with God and a prophet is immersed in the now. Before anything is reformed, you have to be really honest about what it is right now. Before we're going to be a part of changing culture, I think we have to really be honest, brutally honest, and in, in acknowledging what our culture is, whether it's inside or outside of our church culture. It begins with being gut level honest and aware. Um, the rebels and reformers do not hesitate to sand off the shiny veneer of things as we wished they were in order to help us get down to the layer of what really actually is. And I wonder if one reason God chooses teenagers is because I don't know that there is a group that's more immersed in the now. You are fully aware of reality. You guys are living in a reality, quite honestly, that is very different than the reality that my generation experienced. And I would say this extends probably beyond teenagers, those into your 20s. So if you're 29, enjoy it now. You're about to be really out of touch, okay? No. But I, I, think, I think that God um, was, was keenly aware that there would be a young person that would know 
and be really honest about how things were. Instead of being caught up and remembering so much about how things used to be, it's, sometimes it's a little easier for a younger person to say, yeah, well, I've, I've heard your stories about what life used to be like, but hey, this is the reality of the now. This is what it's really like for us. I think there, is, there are these changes that take place that we can try. I, I'm trying so hard to keep up with all these things. I, I'm learning that groovy at one time was a cool word, but now it's like the bomb diggity, and I don't know really what the difference is between these two. But there are some things that when I say them, um, that my kids cringe, and uh, bomb diggity might be one of them. I don't really know. <laughs> But to be rebels and reformers, we need to know a whole lot more than just some goofy phrases. But we need to be honest about what is really going on right here and right now. To be a rebel and reformer, we learn that a prophet must be willing to bear the marks of hands-on involvement. This is really important. Um, If you've come to the first service, you know that um, right here on the end of the third row is where Jacob sits. And I know where each of you sit. You think, you know, we're, we're going to get you a little brass nameplate, okay? Because <laughs> we know where you are. And we also know the look on your face when someone is sitting in your seat, too. So, uh, no, Jacob sits right there on the third row. Um, he is, uh, is going to be teaching this, uh, in Gilroy and coaching football down there. And he and I are always talking about our trucks and why they're not running and on the road and stuff like that. And so last Sunday... Uh, Jacob walks up to me with his hands up like this, um, with uh, still the, the grease kind of stuck in the, in the cracks and crevices of his hands and under his fingernails. And before he said anything, I knew exactly what he was going to say. See, for the last several weeks, he's been waiting on this one part. And once he got that part, then he was going to be able to climb underneath his truck and get it back on the road again. It would be breathing and coming to life. But it was going to be a lot of work in the process. And sure enough, that's exactly what it was. He said that he had spent uh, um, a lot of time in previous days working on it. And his hands showed it. And I asked him if he had actually washed his hands. He said, yes. Um, I'll take his word for it. But his hands indicated that he had crawled underneath the truck and made those repairs. Rebels and reformers have grease on their hands and dirt under their fingernails. Rebels and reformers are involved up close. They are in the midst of the fray and the chaos. They know what is broken, and they know when there is more than a missing part, it's a missing person in Jesus Christ, and they want to be hands-on involved in this. Our city will never be transformed by a group of people who refuse to get their hands dirty. Rebels and reformers bear the marks of hands-on involvement with what is in need of repair. Without sounding like a broken record, there was no greater rebel and reformer than Jesus. And his hands were dirty. He didn't dirty them by sinning, but they got dirty as he embraced people in their sin. His hands bore the marks of reaching out to heal and to help. Um, He was God, hands-on. In John's gospel, um, he very uh, poetically describes Jesus as the Word. And we read these verses, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. The Word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. Jesus got his hands dirty. And not only did Jesus' hands get dirty, he literally bore the marks of hands-on involvement. His hands were dirtied and pierced. That was the extent he was willing to go as a prophet, as a rebel, as a reformer. For you and I to be a rebel and reformer, we have to commit to hands-on involvement. And third, uh, this prophet, this rebel reformer, combines compassion with courage. Um, Jeremiah's natural temperament, this is one of the commentaries that that I read, Jeremiah's natural temperament was such that in order to perform the work required of him, he passed through the most intense anguish 
of spirit. Remember Jeremiah was the weeping prophet? It's because what he saw touched him that deeply. He was crushed by the brokenness of the people around him. Jeremiah didn't just do a job, he felt it. There was something in him, gut-wrenching, where he knew this was not the way God intended things to be. And it broke his heart. Tears are not a sign of weakness. As I've said, tears were um, shed by Jeremiah, but he was a man of great hope. We also see that he was a man of great courage. Um, he was made into a fortified city, an iron pill, a bronze wall. That was the way um, the Lord described to Jeremiah this courageous man that he was going to be. Even though he had this very tender, compassionate side, he was also very, very courageous. God hurled Jeremiah, God threw Jeremiah into some really dangerous situations. At best, they were really awkward. And Jeremiah's courageous obedience and loyalty to God caused him to be in those situations where he wept the most, where he realized the dire situation of the life around him. So I'm going to, what are uh, some personal questions that you can ask yourself? Um, I want you to think about how compassion plays a really big role in where God throws you. He doesn't just kind of randomly toss you. I believe that God specifically throws you into this specific time, into these specific people. And I think a lot of times it will align with our deep compassions, the things that move us. So question number one, what breaks your heart? What is it, whether it's on the news, whether it's something that you see that your kids are struggling with, maybe you're walking with a friend whose marriage is on the rocks, maybe it's something in our educational system, maybe it's just a, a, a desperate social need in our culture, maybe it's something on the other side of the world. What breaks your heart? What is so broken? that it makes you cry? And how could those tears motivate you to courageous action? Maybe even think about it this way. Have you been avoiding a cause because it digs at you so deeply it hurts? We are people that would really rather avoid than get involved sometimes. And sometimes we want to avoid, not because we don't care, but because we care so much it hurts. So let me ask you, what have you diverted your eyes away from out of extreme discomfort? What has God thrown you into the middle of that he's saying, I want you to make eye contact with these people. And I want you to look at them with love. It may be one of the most challenging, gut-wrenching things that you do. Passion obviously forms the root of the word compassion. And when we think of compassion, we think of something uh, of a more sensual nature. We think of something that gives us a tingly feeling, but passion literally means suffering. So when you think of it that way, what are you willing to suffer for? What are you compassionate about? That is something that you are willing to suffer for in order for that to be reformed, in order for that to be made right. Paul says in 2 Corinthians 1 that we comfort others with the comfort we have received. Does your deep passion burn for something that once was broken in you, but Jesus has given you hope, and now you want to go back and you want to comfort others with the comfort you have received? Is your passion for that, would you be willing to die on that hill? Is that something that you feel that deeply about? Don't be surprised if God throws you into something you are passionate about, launches you into a pond of people for whom you are stirred with compassion. And if you don't have a passion for a particular reform, you will not be able to muster the necessary courage to stick it out when things get difficult or dangerous. So don't overlook this burning passion compassion within you. 
Um, a few years ago, I bought a Bible that has extra room in the margins. It's called a journaling Bible. And I bought it and thought this would be, uh, instead of a Bible and a journal, there we go. I got it all in one spot, but the margins um, weren't, weren't wide enough, I guess you could say. And so instead of writing in the margins, what I do is I just put a date on there that corresponds with the journal entry that I have. And so in preparation for today, and this happens um, quite a bit as I'm teaching, uh, preparing to teach, I'll look that passage up in that Bible and I'll see if there's a date uh, some other time in the past where God was highlighting that portion. And so I looked up Jeremiah 1 a few weeks ago, and next to it, it had the date of August 15th, 2016. And so this is what I wrote. The honking and screeching of the female peacock in our neighbor's yard <laughs> may well be the most obnoxious bird sound ever. I have my Bible open to Jeremiah 1, the call of Jeremiah. As beautiful as I imagine God's voice to be, Jeremiah heard the voice as a scary, disruptive screech. The Lord's voice intimidated and challenged rather than calmed and reassured. I've wrestled with my calling to vocational ministry for many, many years. I keep expecting to hear words that comfort and soothe, words that put me at ease and make me feel safe. Although God calls us, it will not be easy. Such was the case for Jeremiah, especially Jeremiah, called to prophesy to hard-headed people. Especially Jeremiah, called to a ministry that would not bear fruit in his lifetime. Especially Jeremiah, whose deep-felt emotions often plunge to dark, despairing depths. I wonder if Jeremiah was a people pleaser by nature, his false self craving the fickle approval of man. God's call would force Jeremiah to confront not only the wayward nation of Israel, but also confront concerns he had about himself. Am I enough? Do I have what it takes? Before challenging a nation, Jeremiah himself was challenged. I, too, have to look inward and hear what God has to say about my false self. As God points out the areas of my life that need his transforming touch, it sounds a lot like the dreadful blaring of that peacock. When I'd rather continue to sleep and dream, God's voice startles me, awakens me. A new day is dawning. Get up. Rebels and reformers hear that. A new day is dawning. Get up. And if you're a little bit scared by what may be ahead, then chances are really good. Yep, you are hearing from God. What is a cultural norm that God wants you to rebel against? What is God waking you up to reform? Now see, the thing that we can fool ourselves into is, is thinking, once I finally figure out what this is, then I can run into it and do it. Or now that I'm excited, once I find something that I'm excited about, then I'm going to do my part. Or once I feel confident and I can eliminate all these excuses, then. So what is it that helps us go and to be rebels and reformers? We go because God is faithful, not because we figured it out, not because we know what we're going to do. We go because God is faithful. We put our lives like a rock in God's hand, and we trust that he is going to throw us exactly where we need to be when we need to be there. I'm going to ask you to bow your heads, and we're going to sing a song in just a moment about God's faithfulness. That's what we need to take this step forward, is his faithfulness. But let me, I'm going to ask a couple of questions, and I want you to answer these not to me, but just think of this as a quiet dialogue between you and God, an opportunity to pray. Can you respond to God in prayer? And verbalize what that empathetic cause is that God wants to hurl you into. 
Can you say yes to that? Or maybe you feel like God has already thrown you into something. Can you just say, okay, God, I don't know how this is going to turn out, but I trust you. Now, without shaming yourself, can you name your excuses in the presence of God? What are the excuses that you give when he says, I'm, I'm about to throw you right here in the midst of, what's your excuse? Maybe like Jeremiah, you think you're too young, or maybe just the opposite. You fear that your time has passed and it's too late. Name those reasons, excuses in God's presence. And now pray this four-word prayer. Lord, you are faithful. Lord, you are faithful. Pray that over and over. Lord, you are faithful. Father, break our hearts for what breaks yours. May our courage not be based upon our strength or our innovations. May they be deeply rooted in the fact that you, God, are faithful and can be trusted. In your name I pray.